go ahead and make some library related announcements so that we can start the program on time. Um, we've got a full program and lots of fun ahead of us, so I don't want to spend too much time on announcements, but we do have a very busy April coming up. Um, as you know, National Library Week takes place every year in April, and this year we have um, events planned every day of the week except for Monday. It's about those. And this is Chuck, who also works with Catherine at her center, so I wanted to make sure we introduce Chuck, because he helped bring over our guest today. And with that, I'll let Catherine get started. Thanks. Give her a warm welcome. I'm thrilled to be here. I'm glad that all of you are interested in some of my stories and uh, interested in the animals. I wanted to tell you a little bit about myself and how I came to be doing what I do because up until Caesar Milan and people like that, um, people like myself were considered to be a little bit odd. And um, when I was growing up, I lived in the, uh, the back of a forest. And from the time I was really tiny, I have memories of just being enthralled by animals. And that's really the word, is enthralled. I was absolutely mesmerized and wanted to be near animals. And I loved frogs as much as I did horses and dogs and cats. And I spent endless hours in the forest. Well, that was before Diane Fossey uh, and people like that made that kind of cool. Um, to rehabilitate thousands of animals, mostly dogs of course, but that gave me my education in what I do right now. So uh, I just went through the numbers and when people come to me and they say, I really want to do what you do, I tell them, go down to the Humane Society and start working with the dogs down there and go through the numbers because that's the way you're going to learn is to go through the numbers and rehabilitate hundreds if not thousands of dogs. And um, I work with a lot of high-level aggression dogs, and this German Shepherd, Lexi, was what you'd call a level five, which is the highest level of aggression. She was uh, highly aggressive towards other dogs, and um, the people that had her said, we've been through a number of trainers, and here's the thing about training, obedience is a great thing, but it has nothing to do with behavioral, so she could do a perfect sit-stay, but that did not affect the way she was. Um, as far as her behavior. So I went and did an evaluation on her. She was one of the worst dogs I'd ever seen. <laughs> and I told them that. And they said, well, what do you think? Does she have a shot? And I said, I think she does. 95% um, of the time, you can rehabilitate. That was a, um, do you guys know what a American Bulldog is? That's an American Bulldog. They're getting to be pretty popular. Um, this girl came to me because she, the, her owners did, no longer wanted her. She had aggression issues. And um, the deal with her was no one had ever really set boundaries with this dog. She was a very dominant female. And when you set a boundary with her, you needed to be really serious about it. So we, I did. I worked with her. and. Um, she got to be okay with other dogs. That was her issue. She was aggressive with other dogs. And she, yeah, she's fine. I got a call from a lady because I put her in the paper. And she said, I think that this is the right dog for my son. So she started telling me about her son. Her son was an athlete, motorcycle enthusiastic guy who had raised and showed um, pit bulls. And he was also a cage fighter. Um, like I said, he was an athlete. Well, sadly, this guy got into a motorcycle accident and became paralyzed from the waist down. So he was in a wheelchair. He was only 28 years old. And um, she said, we had to sell his pit bulls because he can no longer take care of them. And like Harvey, they're pretty high energy. She said, we really need something for him that's kind of like a pit bull but lower energy. lived in a, a dormitory and he did not know he was a snake. He thought that he was one of the girls and that was one thing that I communicated to him because he couldn't understand why the girls were afraid of him 
And he told me, he said, there's a snake in here that frightens the girls. He didn't know it was him. <laughs> so what I did with him was just help him to know who he was. And um, I wanted to tell you a story about a, a cat because one of the ladies came in here this morning when I was setting up and we were talking about cats. Well, if you know anything about cats, the main reason I get called on cats is because they're urinating someplace. And that's, you know, that's a deal breaker uh, for most people because cat pee is like one of the most unpleasant things in the world. Um, I was called out because these people had a cat and she was urinating on the couches. She was urinating uh, in different spots in the house. And they said, she hasn't done this before. She's five years old. She's been doing it for about the last year. So I was in the kitchen talking to the mom and the daughter and trying to figure out what was going on. And the cat came in and started giving me some information. And um, I started asking some questions. And to make a long story short, the cat was urinating because there was a divorce going on in the house. are as different as people as how they love you. I mean, some dogs are lickers, some are not. Some dogs will put their head on you, some dogs are cuddlers. And just like people, you know, some are not. Some are a little more independent than that. So what I always go back to with people all the time is what's the feeling that you get? If you get a good feeling, then it's probably good energy. And if you feel bad about it, like the whole obsession thing, you know, like that, then it, it's not healthy. And here's the thing too, even if your dog is doing this out of love, if you've had enough, then you need to set your boundary and tell them, you know, that's enough, that's okay. You know what I do is I'll like, take my head and put it over his uh -huh. Yeah, that's, that's a communication. That's what dogs do when they're dominant is they'll put their head over the other dog and say, I'm the pack leader and you're not. And that's always a good thing to communicate in their language. You know, but you can, you can look at them and say, stop, that's enough. You know, it's okay. Because it's okay to set boundaries. And it's okay for them to not sometimes lick you or put their paws on you or whatever. Yeah. I think we had a question over here. We've got a male Pomeranian that marks in the back half of our house. Uh -huh. We just replaced the carpet. About a $1,000 project. Is that something the dog would come to you to get help with? How old is he? Five. And he's neutered? Yes. Okay. Did he start this suddenly or has been always doing it? it? I think it's been more so lately, but yes, ever since we've got him. It's usually a pack order thing because that's a dominance thing. That's also saying this is my property and not yours. So, yeah, that would be something that we would work a session at your house with. And what I would do is coach you guys on, on where the holes are in the fabric of your leadership. We also might put him at the center for a little bit because there might be part of something that he's missing about being a dog. But yeah, it's fixable and the sooner the better because it gets worse. Yeah, yeah, instead of better. Um, I jot with my dog frequently or walk and we encounter off-leash dogs quite often. What do you, and I'm just frazzled by this situation, yeah. I carry pepper spray, but what is the best way to, to handle this situation? Because I don't know what the dog's intentions are. Sure. Sometimes, you know, I don't know. Well, the best thing to do is to claim your space. So, you see a dog coming towards you and you already just turn and you just stand right here and you claim your space and you stay calm and if they come up to you you can snap your fingers and tell them you know go away if they make eye contact um, and that's really the best thing you can do is just claim your space tell them no yeah definitely stop moving does your cat go outside that's a tough one because most cats, um, going outside is so integral to their being. And um, obsess scratching on a lot of things is him saying, I don't have enough to do to occupy myself and I'm bored. 
Um, and I know that sometimes you probably provide him with scratching things and all that, and he still wants to scratch on other things. So um, I would encourage you to get on the internet and find one of those kitty tubes. Uh, they have these window unit things that you can build that put a platform out there so that the cat can be in the sun and see the birds. That's just so, that's so integral for a cat to, to feel all that. You're going to keep her much more emotionally healthy by doing that. And by getting her a friend too. Do you have another cat? Yeah. I would get another cat. <laughs> uh, my cat's an only child also, uh, but what I do is I have a harness and a leash, and we go for walks, although I carry her most of the time, but That's okay. she walks with a dog, but we don't have a dog, yeah. so sometimes I borrow a dog ah. to take her for a walk. There you but go. The scratching thing, my kitty has all these toys, or scratching things, and I put catnip in there, and she loves catnip, so she'll scratch the thing, right? Yep. Because she gets a double whammy. She gets the scratching plus the catnip is real. Yeah. Yeah, the walking thing is great. Yeah, the, har the kitty harness. You could do a kitty harness in your backyard sometimes too and go out there and sit with her. 